Hello and welcome to this online event from the AusPNG Network here at the Lowy Institute. My name is Shane McLeod, I'm the Project Director here at the Network. We're coming to you today from the Lowy Institute headquarters in Bly Street, Sydney, which is on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And we acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional owners, their elders and leaders, past, present and emerging. The AusPNG Network receives funding from Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and we thank DFAT for its ongoing support. Also I'd like to acknowledge our network event program sponsors Bank South Pacific BSP, and Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Partners Australia until recently known as Coca-Cola Amatil. Now if you've been staying connected with us over the past few months you'll know we've been focusing our events on COVID-19 and its impact in Papua New Guinea. Since February, PNG has really been copping the brunt of a major surge in the pandemic and that's had a big impact on the health system and on the broader community. Back in April, we caught up with Health Minister Jelta Wong to talk through how the country has been responding to the pandemic. And again, last month, we were able to bring together a discussion about the response in provincial centres. And one topic that keeps coming up in our discussions is the issue of information and how that affects the pandemic response. There's concern about conspiracy theories, about misinformation, fake news and miracle cures, each of which are to some extent undermining public awareness of the virus, the public response to the virus and the success of control measures, as well as the just launched national vaccine rollout. Minister Wong expressed concern about it, talking about online experts. Provincial health workers talk about dealing with it when people come in for treatment, but disagree with health professionals because they've read or watched something online. Which is why we've organised today's event, to talk about the challenges of online misinformation in PNG, to talk about some potential areas to focus on as the country's pandemic response evolves. And to do that, we're going to be helped by two people who've been spending a lot of time looking at exactly this issue. Joyce Eggins and Dr Prashanth Pillay are researchers with the Australian broadcaster ABC and its project in PNG, the Media Development Initiative. Since last year, they've been focusing their research to understand the spread of online misinformation and how it affects the public conversation around health in PNG. And I'm pleased to say they're able to share some of that research with us today. So over to you, Joyce and Prashanth. What can you tell us about your research and what you've been finding out about online misinformation? Thank you, Shane. Um, and it's good to be here and thank you for inviting us. I'm here with my colleague, Joyce, to present to you our latest installment of the, uh, the Kirby Infodemic um, mis Research and Misinformation. Um, so it's based on addressing COVID-19 uncertainties um, emerging in PNG Facebook conversations. Um, I'll just give you a bit of context first to what we explored. Uh, so we're looking at the objectives, methodologies and limitations first before um, Joyce and I would sort of drill uh, in more detail um, to the key findings. And so the fundamental objective um, of this study was really to understand key themes in COVID-19 discussions on Facebook, um, resulting in misinformation and confusion amongst uh, PNG audiences. Um, and we've sort of focused um, on a specific timeline from January to April um, 2021. Um, we have the intended outcome uh, programmed as to inform PNG journalists and communication practitioners to um, produce relevant content to address misinformation. So that's the practical uh, application that we hope to sort of achieve with this research. It should be mentioned that this research is a third, um, a third installment. Um, we have two previous installments, um, and the first was done March to April 2020. Um, and there were some interesting findings coming out of that one, given that it was at the start, uh, towards the start of the pandemic. Um, and one sort of included uh, audience confusion around what misinformation entails. Um, and it also showed that there were different understandings um, of how media should address unverified information. Um, so there's quite a bit of discussion on Facebook around that. And the second tracker we sort of implemented from May to June 2020. Um, and this really showed, the findings really showed the preeminence of conspiracy theories for the first time sort of surfaced. Um, and there was there was references to the establishment um, of a new world order, um, and you know the perception or the misconstrued perception that COVID nineteen was possibly a man made virus. So we were starting to see um, a greater sort of solidifying of these conspiracy theories. 
Um, and it was also sort of concrete appeals for, for more clear data around COVID-19. So now we transition to the January and April um, part of the research. And I'll just move to the next slide. Um, in terms of methodology, uh, more than 36,391 posts were analyzed um, across 18 Facebook groups. Um, and we sort of automated the process um, with a combination of uh, Python software programming and uh, sort of a, a customized concordance software as well. Um, and it's just worth noting that the main unit of analysis for our entire research was the number of references made um, in relation to each theme in the research. Um, and just for your knowledge, a reference to a theme is a unique instance um, and part of a post or its entity sort of highlights a broader theme. So it does not necessarily equate to the number of posts per se. Um, and just some contextual observations more broadly. Um, for this research, for this installment, we found that misinformation was predominantly identified um, in Facebook comments responding to news reports on COVID-19 and vaccines. So these were comments in response to a primary post either published by a media news organization or a, or a, um, a specific community. Um, it should be noted that we've only analyzed um, public Facebook where the data was sort of accessible to all. Um, we also found there was a strong public distrust and suspicion surrounding institutional support um, for vaccines. And compounding that there were 25% more posts now relative to the same last year about PNG um, being a vaccine trial site. And I'll, we'll go into more detail on how this sort of um, developed in the subsequent slides. In terms of limitations, just very quickly, um, obviously due to our resource uh, constraints, only English posts were analyzed for this research. Um, and you know, as, as most of you know, trends are highly volatile from week to week um, in any social media analysis. So um, they should be sort of analyzed or rather interpreted in context to the time that we, we sort of sample this data. Um, and again, a small sample relatively of popular Facebook groups were analyzed um, and they were based on reach numbers. And we've had like extensive consultations with the MDI team and Joyce was leading those um, just to sort of pick out and identify the key Facebook groups um, that we'll be analyzing. And finally, it should be mentioned that Facebook comments uh, to posts were only analyzed for posts with a high engagement rate. So we're looking um, at posts where, uh, looking at comments of posts where there was a clear um, discursive value and a clear strong sort of level of discussion that we could extract themes and thematic relevance from. Um, just moving on to the key insights uh, very quickly. And one of the key dominant themes was around unsubstantiated claims of PNG as a vaccine um, trial site. So there was considerable discussion on PNG uh, being used as a trial site to explore the full effects, um, especially of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and there was a general sentiment that um, pharmaceutical companies and international governments were using PNG as sort of a test case um, amongst other countries uh, to understand vaccine side effects and associated medical complications. Um, there was also unsubstantiated claims that the World Health Organization um, was part of sort of a broader um, conspiracy to organize sporadic trials on vaccine efficacy um, in PNG communities. So it should be noted that 45% of posts um, also carried links to globally reported cases of blood clotting with the AstraZeneca vaccine. But what's interesting is that these references to posts and the sharing of posts from major, major news organizations, such as articles from The Guardian or the ABC or the Herald Sun, were often decontextualized from the actual editorial intent of these posts. Um, so information was then misappropriated um, to sort of further a specific agenda as well. And that's something we found um, was a common theme, and particularly in this sample. So generally, there was public distrust um, in a lot of pharmaceutical companies, international governments, um, as I said, including the WHO, just around vaccine purpose and efficacy. Um, just sort of moving on to the next slide and the next theme, what we also found was um, there was widespread misinformation um, and confusion around the purpose of vaccines um, and its impact on the immune system. So these were more um, sort of scientific misconceptions of what vaccines were supposed to do and the role they were supposed to serve. Um, and there were th three main typologies as to how this confusion was articulated. So 
I'll just sort of go through them quite briefly. The first misconception was that vaccines should not have any um, side effects. Um, so post this question why vaccines were still being administered when they were publicly known um, side effects, with many stating that properly researched or manufactured vaccines um, should not have any of those side effects. Um, and these claims were frequently voiced um, on the back of reports that were produced around the time uh, PNG announced its acquisition of the AstraZeneca vaccine. I think that was around um, March 9th. The other misconception that we also sort of identified was that um, one should only be vaccinated um, upon receiving a positive COVID-19 test. So here, were, here we found identified unsubstantiated claims that vaccines are meant to cure um, COVID-19 patients. Um, and it was sort of a, people have often had a polarized view on this um, and they sort of universally equated vaccines to sort of curing um, the, the pandemic in some respects. And finally, um, the third misconception that we sort of highlighted was that individuals who were vaccinated, who are vaccinated, need not take any further health precautions. Um, and this was really in relation to um, vaccinated politicians in PNG were criticized in posts for actually wearing masks. And many sort of interpreted that as a, as a sign of weakness or a sign that a vaccine was not actually working as intended. Um, and a lot of narratives were sort of based on that into sort of criticizing the actual role of vaccines in the first place. Um, so right now, I've sort of completed the two major themes, but I'll just sort of transition over and pass it over to my, to my colleague who will be able to sort of bring you through some of the remaining themes with more granular localized uh, detail as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prashant. I'll let you manage the controls on the slide over there. Um, sure. And I will speak to the, the next slide here. So we observed widespread criticism against church leaders um, who got the vaccination. They were seen as betraying their religious beliefs and their values. So under this theme, more than half of the posts believe that announcements by church leaders on taking the vaccine amounted to propaganda and as a way of seeking government validation. Sir John Ribat, a prelate of the Roman Catholic Church in PNG, was viewed as a key figure in promoting the vaccine. And just moving on to the next slide now, following from the findings of last year's tracker, there was a substantial number of posts on the effectiveness of home remedies in curing COVID-19. Uh, remedies included steam baths, uh, lemon, ginger, garlic drinks, and hot water. Most of these comments were responding to mainstream media news stories on COVID-19 uh, vaccination rollout plans. So onto the next slide, news reports specifically on COVID-19 misinformation on social media were widely disregarded as baseless and again, uh, gender driven. Media outlets such as the National Broadcasting Corporation and Post Korea have posted articles on the public health dangers of subscribing to COVID-19 misinformation. Most of these stories have been publicly criticized by posters as pandering to government pressure. So I'll hand over to uh, Prashant again to look at the supplementary findings. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, just in terms of these supplementary findings that we, um, that we thought were worth sort of highlighting. So we found there were only four instances where page administrators of our sampled Facebook groups um, intervened to moderate instances of moderate instances of misinformation. Um, and all four instances were actually from NBC News. Now, um, what we've seen is from past installments of the research, we've actually seen a gradual decline in terms of uh, moderation generally across the board. Um, while this research doesn't cover the reasons as to why um, there was less intervention from a, from a management point of view in terms of managing quality information, um, it does show that it becomes increasingly more challenging towards controlling the flow, towards sort of um, measure, um, managing the flow information once there's a sort of a large sample of posts that go online. Um, so the second observation was that while it's not a major team, there was a considerable number of posts highlighting um, the perceived absence of expert discussion in the media by qualified um, PNG-based scientists and medical practitioners um, on the vaccine and related side effects. 
Um, now, this was an observation based on our sample. Um, whether this is sort of an actual fact in reality, again, it's up for, for debate, but there was definitely a sort of a sense that um, there could be perhaps a stronger representative voice um, from the local scientific community based in PNG um, to correct these misconceptions uh, more publicly. Um, and the third sort of uh, final finding was that, supplementary finding was that there was an upwards trajectory um, in a number of posts relating to PNG as a vaccine trial site um, in the month of May, showing that this theme, um, if you look at it from a longitudinal perspective, um, continues to sort of dominate within the sampled uh, mainstream social media conversations. So in other words, we would expect to see the predominance of these team um, perhaps in a month and a month after uh, based on current trends, if we were to sort of uh, do a predictive graph in that sense. Um, so in terms of just summarizing this very quickly, and Joyce, feel free to chime in, but these were some of the uh, main um, points. So there was, firstly, we looked at unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated claims of PNG as a vaccine trial site. Um, we looked at also the confusion of medi the medical role of vaccines and, and how you know that has affected uh, sort of clear scientific communication. Um, there was also, as Joyce had sort of covered in detail, criticisms leveled against vaccinated church leaders, was sort of a burgeoning trend. Um, there was unsubstantiated claims of home remedy cures, and this was something that we identified even in the last two installments of this research. So that's one consistent theme across the board. Um, and finally, as Joyce mentioned as well, there was public disagreement around social media's role um, in perpetuating misinformation. And perhaps from a, from a media practice point of view, um, this is perhaps most, in a way, most concerning, given that um, there was active, there seems to be an active effort required in terms of correcting how people construe misinformation, how they define misinformation, and, and what can be done in a more larger scale. Um, thank you. That's sort of the basis of our main research. And, and again, we're very glad to present it to you all today. Thank you. Prashant, thanks so much for that. That's, uh, there's so much for us to talk about there. Um, I've got questions. I've lots of questions, but you might have some watching remotely as well. The, the, if you're joining us on Zoom, the Q&A function is enabled. You'll be able to lodge your questions there. And uh, later in uh, the hour, we'll be able to come to some of your questions as well. But this is a good time to bring in our other two panellists because there is lots to talk about. First, I'll bring in Dr. Gary Now, who's the senior doctor and the provincial liaison and uh, EMT lead with the PNG National Control Centre for COVID-19. Good to see you there, Gary. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good day, good day. Thank you. And no worries. And Belinda Cora is joining <laughs> us as well. G'day, Belinda, Secretary of the Media Council of PNG, a very well-known journalist in PNG and someone dealing with these information issues every day. So thanks for being there, Belinda. And I've oh, got Joyce thank and you. there as well. Um, look, first question, I might actually <coughs> come to you, Gary, because you are dealing with this day to day as a frontline healthcare professional. What impact is misinformation having for people like you, doctors in emergency wards, dealing with patients coming through the door? What, what do you see? Yeah, so, <clears throat> thank you. Um, the misinformation is rampant, and as the presentation is clearly showed, uh, the misinformation across all mediums of media, especially the social media, and the types of misinformation are quite scary. Um, the range of information and the accessibility to it, um, people's reactions to it, and then how the percep general perception of the public is to it, let, let alone health workers' perception towards the misinformation. Um, mm. We have a health worker population that has a lot of hesitancy towards the vaccination programs already. Um, if the health workers don't get it, the general public are not going to get it. And a lot of the misinformation that was shared on the presentation, um, I actually interviewed uh, uh, over 100 health workers in NCDC, each their opinion before the before the vaccination uh, before the vaccines arrived, just to gauge if the acceptance was there. And the, the results are similar to what's been said, and uh, all of the fears that you mentioned they are quite evident um, in, in that little survey I did as well. Right down to now, we are looking at the increasing numbers that um, we saw recently with the surge. Um, we are thankful that the surge is now settled down in Port Moresby. There are little surges that are happening across the country. A low acceptance of vaccination. Um, 
and then the, and then the potential for surges that will happen in the country. The low acceptance of the non-pharmaceutical interventions as well in the general public. It's a scary outlook for us as health workers. Um, I might jump in and get Belinda to talk to us about this as well. Belinda, you're a journalist. You've been working in the PNG media for nearly two decades. Uh, what I found interesting about what Prashanth and, and Joyce just presented is that it's news stories being shared that are the basis for people then spreading the misinformation. Is that a surprise to you? Um, you realise that while the presentation was on, I was actually... Um nodding my head because it was actually true. I've been, I, the Media Council of Papua New Guinea is very concerned about not only are we trying to, um, the mainstream media is trying to overcome its own challenges in the newsroom during this pandemic. It has, it has forced its staff and its, itself and the editors themselves to try and look into uh, another threat that has just popped up in the last three to four months, and that is the misinformation. And uh, it is a concern for the council, not only because of that, but because um, uh, reporters themselves need help. Not only are they trying to understand the virus itself and also trying to speak to experts, but they're also faced with that challenge also of, of, of trying to get in experts on time, trying to you know, analyze what they want to do today for COVID angle, tomorrow for COVID angle, and speak to experts who can be able to counter some of these uh, comments that are being made. I'm happy to note that MTV, NBC, uh, have, and Post Korea especially, uh, have been pushing for their online stories and writing more of it, trying to ensure, writing more factual stories around COVID and the vaccines Trying to ensure that they try to counter it, but it's 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 work in progress. Shane, it's not an easy task every day. Yeah, Joyce, in in your presentation, you talked about um, Cardinal Ribat and the fact that prominent community leaders who come out and talk about COVID, talk about vaccinations, are then caught up and uh, are sort of claimed to be as part of the conspiracy. What do you think is driving that? What what? What is driving people to sort of wrap people into those kind of misinformation topics? Yeah, it's probably the sort of overwhelming um, the narratives around that hesitancy to take the vaccine and the myths around COVID um, that's uh, manifesting in sort of the sources uh, that people trust for information are now becoming sort of um, bled on people. Like when you look at church leaders, um, and churches themselves, they are among the most trusted sources of information for a lot of rural communities. And that, and when you, when you have arguments on platforms like social media, where not a lot of um, uh, sort of grassroots communities get onto, you have that group there who are talking about it and um, having these discussions around sort of um, uh, uh, the vaccination and COVID-19, and you have church leaders who come out and, and say, look, take the vaccine, it's good for you, it'll protect you against the virus. That, I guess, with all that conversation that's going on around social media, it, it, I think it adds to the, the doubts that's now sort of growing among different sources of information, including the churches. And Gary, back to you, like when, when this happens, when community figures get wrapped up in some of this misinformation just by having spoken about an issue, does it turn people off? Like, do you have, among your colleagues, are people reluctant to be seen speaking in public about some of these issues? Yes, um, admittedly, even myself, um, because of social media attacks and uh, risks of security issues and all of that, that uh, parent in the community, we, we are a bit hesitant to speak about uh, issues that like vaccine hesitancy and all of that because of the attacks we face. Um, but it is important that we do. It's our civic responsibility that as leaders in the health field, um, we need to stand up for information that's right and the most safest options for our community need to be heard um, as opposed to the misinformation out there. So we have to fight the battle. Um, even I face the hesitancy, but I, I, I have to do my bit as well, uh, come out in the media, speak, and then do the public relations um, 
outreach and all of that because it's important um, we need to lead and every community leader and every health worker in the country need to lead. they need to take this on board and take it as their responsibility Prashant, really can I come back to you? Sorry to interrupt, Gary, but I'll come back to Prashant because I'm interested to know if, if the, it's essentially in the comments on, we're talking about on Facebook here, we're talking about comments in relation to posts perhaps from news outlets or from the government, something like that. Is it organised? Is it, I guess, what you'd almost call a, a drive-by comment where one person sees a post and says one thing and leaves it? Or are you seeing... Um, sustained efforts or sustained campaigns by people against some of the information that's out there? That's a great question. Um, so we actually did a more granular level of analysis to just sort of identify if there were any patterns uh, in terms of who the types of accounts that were sort of disseminating this sort of mis misinformation. And uh, what we found was in total, um, there were about 112 um, accounts that were constant, consistently featuring um, as sources of mis misinformation and um, they've been sort of we've sort of allocated them by frequency levels and we found that these 112 have at least been responsible for 20 or more posts in the comment section so it, it's a significant number and a group enough to actually um, obviously enough from a statistical point of view to shift a public perception on, on key health response issues and something that needs to be sort of addressed quite imminently Linda, something I've noticed is there have been some people who have connections, say, to the medical or scientific community who have commented on some of these issues and, and get a lot of prominence. Um, I was wondering if you might comment on that, that, that situation where people who might have a connection to science or, or health, perhaps, who uh, say something in public or comment on issues, maybe not directly related to their expertise, but get a lot of prominence and compare that to your capacity as a journalist to access the people who are very busy dealing with the pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you go in terms of getting access to experts and how do you go filtering the people who might, I guess, appear to be experts? Uh, the Media Council uh, realized, and we've actually had a meeting on the weekend, uh, myself and um, the president and the vice president, solely because of Issue that our members are actually faced with, and um, it's it, it's it's something that, um, as a journalist, uh, when we started off March last year covering COVID nineteen, I realized that um, we had, um, and what, and I'm just pertaining back to what Gary No, uh, Dr. Gary No, had just mentioned. Um, we had quite a number of um, experts that we could speak to scientific people who are studying viruses here in the country, uh, former Institute of Medical Research experts, you know, we have a lot of them here and we were managing to get in touch with them, uh, not myself only, but the rest of the media. And then all of a sudden they just went quiet, like they didn't answer our calls. Uh, I'm, I was trying to understand why that was the case. Uh, that, that started um, as soon as we started to see the second surge of cases here in the country um, and trying to get them on a very busy schedule, especially when during the time when the cases were rising, and not only in Port Moresby, the rest of the country, was pretty, pretty much difficult. Um, they'd give us a timing, but when we called at that specific time the next day, they were shifted doing something else. And then another confusion came about when we had contradictory opinions from our own experts. That made it quite difficult for our reporters to try and grasp because we're reporters, we're not experts, you know? So we were very dependent on opinions and people who study viruses. And of course, COVID is new, we understand that. It is always changing, but at least getting an expert on time was, was very much difficult unless you could be able to commit to continuously checking on them. That's what I was basically doing. Um, I know they'd really get tired and I know Dr. Gary No got tired of me, but uh, at the end of the day, I had to do my job. And as Mr. Uh, Dr. Gary No said, he also had a role to play. And um, it's about time that um, people understand, especially all those in authorities, how important the, the role of media is um, in trying to disseminate information. Uh, and um, the experts who were able to understand that and grasp that, was making life easier for us as journalists by picking up the phone and answering our WhatsApp 
or answering my call. That's basically how it was helping my story. Um, when I was you know, trying to put out a story without having an expert opinion, it just didn't seem right. I, I felt it was not justice for people who needed the information and not only just the information and update on the number of cases, but explaining to them what this vaccine will do to you and how many cases we're having now and what's the risks we face, what are the risks we face. That can't come from me. That needs to come from the experts and I'm just the platform providing that. So we always had to be reminded of that. And more importantly, that has been a challenge for many journals who have been covering COVID um, so far. And that is ensuring that we have that expert voice as clearly highlighted in, in the research. And I think I'll come back to this question of experts and, and who, who are the best people to be communicating some of these messages. But I wanted to jump back to something that came from Joyce and Prasant's presentation earlier around moderation. You mentioned that um, there'd been a few examples of moderation you were able to find, but I also know just from moderating our own Facebook page here at the Institute, <laughs> moderating social media is a massive challenge. It's a huge effort. Um, but I'm interested, and I don't know if it's uh, something for you, Joyce, or Prashant, uh, how can it feasibly work in terms of that social media space? How can you manage that flow of commentary, that flow of information, which is driving a lot of the misinformation? Where does the responsibility lie, do you think? Maybe, Joyce, if you'd like to talk about that first. Mm. That's a full-time job to be moderating uh, online, on a, especially on Facebook, where most of our um, media are sort of reaching their audience and audience commenting. Um, I think we saw, to some degree, an attempt to moderate the conversations. But I think, as I said, it is a full-time job, but does need someone to sit there and actually think through the comments that are coming through, and especially if they're generating more and more comments to um, have someone also have um, information that's accurate on hand to counter. And these are the types of people who also need, I guess, access to support such as um, how, to, how to look at the integrity of the information and how to respond respectfully, diplomatically, still sort of encouraging engagement and dialogue, but um, presenting also uh, countering with accurate information and sources for going to it. Um, that is a struggle sometimes with media organizations because they don't all have sort of the human resources and the capital to do that. Um, and that is an area I think um, should be looked at as well um, to support media organizations to sort of have someone there full time to moderate uh, their online spaces and especially Facebook. Um, and um, there's also this, um, um, uh, we use a lot of WhatsApp in the country and there's a lot of information flowing through that space as well. And, and then it comes through onto Facebook or vice versa. And so even where media organizations are reaching out to their sort of audience, listener groups or whatever through the WhatsApp to be really sort of careful about how um, and what kind of information is going in and out of there close groups or um, pages and stuff. Gary, I imagine from the pandemic control side of things at the National Control Centre, these information issues are a massive challenge. In terms of capacity, does, does PNG's government, does the department have the ability to put the type of resources in like that, that could, I guess, provide almost like an online, on-demand interactive service? It just seems like such a, a huge ask. Um, when you're thinking about all the other tasks that you're managing at the moment with the pandemic. What do you think is feasible? Yeah, I think with the pandemic response the, from the National Control Centre, what's actually happened is we've actually restructured our uh, response mechanism so that the communication team are all part and parcel bundled together and they cross uh, multi-clusters. Uh, so you've got under the communications team, you will have the non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, new papacin and uh, media communications and all, and, and uh, print and other, and UNICEF and all of them will come under the same um, one big cluster that handles all of them together. Um, this, the social media 
platform moderation is one thing that is highlighted almost daily. And we're monitoring, looking at different, uh, you know, uh, misinformation and also good and bad information that pops up on Facebook. Um, and this is, we, we do address it uh, at our level. But then again, the pages and the moderations are with, we don't actually have our national coordination center and put out information. They do to an extent, but it's not the main source of our information coming out. Um, the WHO Papua New Guinea site and the National Department of Health site are moderated separately. Uh, and they, they moderate their own sites and then they put out information as well. But from our point of view, over the last month, we've restructured and we're moving forward towards a more um, cross-level communication structure that bundles all the communication together. So we have one streamlined message and we everybody preaches the same thing. So there's no you know, confusion about what we're talking about and, and different opinions. Everyone should understand the same subject matter. And especially going out into the media, everybody should be to be having the same party line, uh, if, if you, I may use the term, yeah. Yeah, thanks Gary. So I want to talk about experts and this, this challenge <laughs> that I think is inherent in some of the social media sharing of expertise, because if people are being caught up, um, you know, being wrapped up in conspiracy theories because they comment on things, how do you cut through that? Who are the experts um, who would have the most cut through? Belinda. I might come back to you and just um, from the journalistic <laughs> perspective, who do you think have been the effective communicators with the public around COVID-19 and what are the things that you think um, are the, the skills that people need in communicating some of these challenges? Mm. I think there's been a, probably a number of committed experts I've been able to talk to and have been easily um, Accessible and easily accessible by the media in the country. Um, I think the the um, deputy controller, Mr. Uh, Dami, uh, I know uh, he's been a very busy person in the last couple of months, but he's been able to um, come out strong uh, with actual findings and statistics, and because he says has access to WHO and also um, the health department and also PHAs around the country, he's been able to please give us um, opinions and of course views in relation to different angles to COVID, especially during the rollout and of course COVID, uh, COVID vi the, the virus itself. Um, also have, I've also seen um, Dr. Yoko Pua at the Port Mosby General Hospital has been really good with um, assisting the media. Um, we've also had one or two female doctors also, Dr. Mary Bagita and also Dr. Kendino from Port Mosby General Hospital have been able to also speak with us. And you also have Dr. Glenn Muller, who has been uh, able to speak with the media. And um, I think those are, for now, those are the only people I can think of that has been able to um, speak to us more openly about the role they play. And maybe because um, um, they've been given that permission to do so at that level, or they've they, they see within their role that it is, it is important to talk to us about um, the issues surrounding COVID and vaccines. And what, what's even more important is that um, the reporters that are interviewing them uh, understand what they want to get from them, which is also another challenge in itself. Uh, understanding what's happening on the social media front, what's trending uh, before you even ask a question is also very, very, very important because it, it, it enables you to write for, for relevance, you know, of what's, what's currently happening in Papua New Guinea. And when you talk about mainstream media, I think a lot of people tend to forget that we're quite small and we're trying to penetrate to the whole country and it, it is not easy. I've known that in the last couple of months and also in the years of my, my experience in the country while, while reporting is word of mouth seems to be more faster than mainstream, <laughs> especially in the rural areas and also in the urban cities. And that's been something that um, even I had to deal with with my own relatives who are already um, not only um, showing 
know, the, the um, perspective of their own opinions in family gatherings because Belinda Cora is there. So it, it, it is really, really challenging personally, and it's also challenging when, when trying to report about it factually and ensuring that you, know, you consider that everyone doesn't have the same opinions as the experts you're speaking to. And that has been something that we've had to counter. Gary, just back to you, something we were talking about off stage before we started the event today was the idea of what other community leaders are persuasive and, and help to build health messaging. Um, who do you think can contribute in this space? I mean, we, we briefly talked about sports figures, uh, perhaps it's church figures. Uh, who do you think can help build the health messaging? Yeah, so, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so the health messaging uh, it, at the moment is more nationally based and, uh, and more broader community based in provincial levels and all of that. And it also needs to be contextualized down to the grassroots level as well. Um, and taking these health messages right down to them so they understand why it's important or why after vaccination, what's the light at the end of the tunnel? Um, and what's the, after you get vaccinated, why do you need to wear a mask for a month? Or why do you need to wait for everyone else to get vaccinated before you can take the mask off? Um, and, and all of that understanding has to go down, filter right down to the community level. And just rushing along, you can, I'll just jump straight to the point, you know, there's, uh, in, in our families, in our the conversations are shared around the dinner tables and in, in the small communities. And usually the head of the household is the one that dictates to the, to the household, I mean, what's the direction for us as a family? Um, <clears throat> I know it's difficult to, to see, but we've got to really get down to that level and, and, and address the information on a personal level to individuals and then on a family level to families, messaging towards families and then messaging towards communities and, and involving community leaders in, in, in uh, structures that are already existing. We're not gonna recreate the wheel and, and, and try to use systems that, aren't, um, that we're gonna build new. We have political figures of, like the governor for NCD, uh, Honorable Paul Spaco. He's got a big political machinery behind him. Uh, and if he's got community leaders in each single little community in, in Nine Mile Settlement, in eight miles settlement in all of Mosby. And those community leaders are the ones we bring in, we educate, and we teach them about COVID-19 and they take that message back. And they start telling their communities and their little, it's gonna take time. Um, and I'm not sure how much time we have on our side, but it's gonna happen. Uh, if we want to win this battle against uh, misinformation and getting the right messaging out there, and even just telling people where to get the correct information from. Don't believe this and don't believe and believe this and that has to happen from people which they see every day as leaders to them and even to the health professionals. Uh, if there's no good uh, me standing in front of the media and saying what I think should happen with COVID because uh, I'm only known to select group of people and I to my patients at Gero Hospital, for instance, they would see me around and they would trust me because I'm their doctor day to day. Um, but uh, the, the doctor that's a surgeon in, in Goroka General Hospital for the emergency physician, Dr. Aaron, would, would see patients every day and him coming out in the media to the Eastern Highlands community, they would know him, they would trust him. And that would be very effective. Might be one of the challenges is for um, health professionals in PNG is helping them, helping them to find ways to communicate. And maybe it is through online, um, you know, online media, social media in smaller contexts. I'm aware of the time. I'm aware that we've got some fantastic questions coming in and, and a really big audience out there. So I'd like to get to as many as we can. Um, I'm just having a look here. There's a good one I'll kick off with from Yuanbari Haihui at Transparency PNG. G'day. Um, for Belinda, the spread of misinformation seems to be an indication of widespread public distrust in national institutions. So how can journalists be supported to rebuild some of that institutional trust? We'd appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael from TIP and Julian Barry for that question. Very interesting question. I, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm gonna answer that, but uh, I'll try my best. Um, we're putting a lot of pressure on you with this one, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that is true that um, we've been reading a lot of comments in relation to, uh, especially online on Facebook, uh, especially to do with um, uh, news stories from different agencies, um, different um, uh, 
line of departments that are responsible in the response against COVID. Um, what we've actually done and what I've seen other media houses do uh, when they do get, um, you know, the, the, the comments in relation to um, the public um, questioning the role, um, are these statistics true? Um, did we really have this number, a number of deaths? Um, where is the um, money is in relation to COVID-19 being spent? Um, yes, that is true that there is a, 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 it is trust and that I cannot deny when I'm reading um, comments. Uh, what is very important for us to do and what we must continue to do is to fight and to continue to write the stories that need to be told. Um, and that has not been easy for us as a mainstream media. Um, but we will continue to um, pursue um, a lot of our outstanding follow-ups and we will continue to call the people that need to be answerable and responsible for um, everything that is surrounding the response of COVID in Papua New Guinea. And I think it's work in progress for the media. Um, I think we'll need to continue to do that in the next couple of months. So uh, that's all I can say for now. Thanks, Belinda. Now, just I'll just flag that we've uh, lost Gary, so I won't be able to ask Gary any questions until we can hopefully get him back into the call. But in the meantime, I'll throw one in Joyce's direction. Uh, this is from Corinne Podger, who's watching us, I think, from down here in Sydney. G'day, Corinne. <coughs> um, the question is, is criticism being expressed on social platforms, for example, of the church leaders who've been vaccinated, do you think that is resulting in an actual decline in people's uh, intention to get vaccinated in vaccination rates? Yeah, I can't say for sure if that would sort of uh, translate to people not getting the vaccination. Um, but it does influence that conversation to a certain degree. Um, I think over many years, um, communities in PNG have sort of been sustained through either the one top system the church network system and so there's still a large element of trust in um in church uh, leaders and in the church itself um the overwhelming conversation as i said in the beginning is sort of on that platform and whether or not it manifests in people not getting the vaccination is is something i cannot say for sure or comment on but it does influence the conversations um in places where people have access to sort of Facebook and can also influence the conversations that may happen off Facebook. Yeah, I can see we've got Gary back online, so it might be a good one I can um, also Thank put you. to him. And Gary, you have um, you were not online when I was asking this one of Joyce, but um, do you worry that the commentary about public figures and the criticism when they get vaccinations, do you worry that that is leading to a decline in overall vaccination rates or intention of people to get vaccinated? Um, yeah. Uh, it's sorry, my Wi-Fi just popped off. Uh, um, apologies, but uh, yes, it is a big worry because they, these are chosen leaders and um, they are vaccination heroes. They are taking the front foot and um, taking the lead to take the vaccination. Um, it's almost like we can't do anything right in the eyes of the public uh, with the amount of uh, lack of trust that they've lost uh, for for the response uh, over the year. Um, and it's unfortunate that the leaders now that are taking the vaccine and that are copying the brunt of the mistrust that's in the community. Um, but it worries me because then it affects the vaccine uptake um, and it counters all our efforts to get people vaccinated. Prashant, I'll throw one your way. This is sort of based on a question from Kimberly Gardner who asks about uh, the need for a mass communications campaign to address misperceptions and misleading information. In what you've seen through the research, are some messages cutting through better than others? And do you think there are any signs of what would be a, an effective way to, to communicate at a sort of a mass media level? Great question. Um, in terms of online misinformation, um, that this research was focused on, there are three sort of areas that could be addressed. Um, just in terms of the first, I think, would be uh, just addressing instances where accurate information is actually posted as well. Um, too often we have to focus on instances where you know there's misinformation, but actually louding uh, conversations that are perhaps logical and, and based on evidence uh, should also feature in a lot of mass 
uh, communication campaigns as well. Um, and I think the focus should also be too prominent when you're looking at uh, social media. You look at the false information and the negative information, you remove them, but also in terms, there needs to be a concerted attention towards communicating um, accurate information as well. Um, often we are too focused on removing misinformation and sort of correct and sort of, you know, implying that something is false, but what is the alternative and what, where can it, where can you get truthful narrative out there, um, you know, to balance it out. So I think it's sort of a, it's a balancing game when you sort of think of, uh, you know, think of it in a mass communication sort of a paradigm. Great. Thanks, Prashant. Um, I've got one here from Sean Dorney. G'day, Sean. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, he asked if there's been an effort to get Justin Olam to urge people to get vaccinated, or would he also <laughs> find himself caught up in uh, conspiracy theories? What do you reckon, Gary? Would uh, Justin Olam help get people vaccinated? Uh, yes, Justin Olam's already done a video for us. Um, he's already been approached. Uh, I, I think Justin Olam's uh, above, uh, above such criticism. <laughs> rugby league is so popular here. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. The rugby league stars are, are almost immune to this. Well, it can definitely help, I, I think, build a bit of momentum. All right, next question. Um, one here from Ann Kruger, and I might uh, send this one your way, Belinda. Um, how confident do you think reporters are in dealing with misinformation online? And do they need more support to identify oh. and respond? Um, and I might also get you, Joyce, to respond after Belinda on that one. Yes, a very, very important question. When it comes to misinformation, I must point out that um, the council had realised that a lot of our reporters definitely need a lot of help. We have a lot of young health reporters who have been pushed to cover the pandemic all of a sudden without enough uh, weapons to arm themselves, especially how to ask the questions they need to ask. And trying to um, analyze information and, and put out to the public. So um, it is very, very vital that uh, our newsrooms get that help. Uh, the council at this time is working with partners like the UN, WHO, and the National Coordination Center to um, start holding trainings in the next couple of months for our reporters here. Um, this is to help them to better understand and have experts in there doctors and especially nurses and also um, people who are able to assist the council and give us enough time on the weekend just to ensure that we are able to help our reporters at this time because uh, um, I guess the, the older uh, reporters in the newsroom uh, are also busy with other rounds. They're not able to help many of the reporters that are new and young and trying to do help rounds and do the COVID round. So, but that, that would be also good to point out that, yes, our newsrooms definitely, definitely need a lot of help at this time in order to counter a lot of misinformation that is not even filtered due to newsrooms not being able to have that capacity to, to do so. Joyce, it's probably yeah. something that's going to, it's going to keep you busy. Um, something you and might it be is. Yes, doing some the eye around. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, for a lot of the newsrooms, um, there must be an appreciation of sort of the numbers that are out there and the things that they do and the ability to go out and get a story every day and file for hourly bulletins or your main bulletin. And um, there, there is a need for sort of content research support uh, in newsrooms. So you have your people go out and you collect stories and events and stats and you come in. Um, but there's sort of depth to the information that you need really quickly. And you need someone who can get that for you really quickly. And so that is a, an element of support that um, certainly we, we've been um, doing sort of here with um, media organizations, um, our partners, the national broadcasters and that, but um, they're finding it really useful to have um, content guides that just give information from policy to stats to sources for references and mm. for them to quickly just access it and go, okay, that's gonna help build a story on this um, that is using sort of credible um, information um, straight at their fingertips because time every day they're meeting deadlines. Mm. And um, again, some of the challenges of doing that kind of business in this country. Um. Some good questions here, sort of a combo. I'm going to bring in two parts from Sue Ahern and Tess Newton-Kane. It's, it's asking about um, 
as the panel, have you seen any evidence of Facebook's campaign against misinformation in PNG? Um, and do, do you have any um, signs or examples where Facebook has stepped in to moderate or remove posts that are perpetuating misinformation? And Gary, maybe I'll come to you on this. I mean, through the NCC, have you had any outreach from some of these social platforms and ways that they can help you around these information challenges? Yeah, no, so uh, Facebook, um, as an organization has reached out to Papua New Guinea and uh, made it clear that they will be addressing the misinformation in the country. I, I think that from the national level has, has, has gone up to them to request that assistance. So they, they have started, uh, um, in Papua New Guinea, started uh, blocking off misinformation sites. And and also uh, I've noticed that as soon as you flag the misinformation, it's, it's, it's taken off offline immediately. Uh, which is good. So we are getting that assistance from the, uh, from the platform, yes. That's good to know, Gary. Um, a follow-up question for Prashant and for Joyce on their uh, information from earlier, and it's a question from Sharon Pingy. Uh, and she asks if you've been able to do any analysis of some of the commenters to get a sense, uh, are they real users? Do they have older accounts? Are they more, you know, burner account type setups? Are they real names? Do they have any specialization? Are you seeing that? Have you been able to dive into that uh, to get any sense of that? Uh, in terms of the Facebook um, analysis, we didn't do it at that level of granularity. So we could tell if accounts were similar, but we couldn't determine if they were actually bot accounts. Um, I think from an analytical point of view, that's easier to do with Twitter because there are proprietary software out there where you could actually determine um, if an account exhibits uh, patterns of that of being a, a bot or an automated account. But it's slightly harder when it comes to Facebook from my understanding. So for the analysis that we have done so far, we've just focused on patterns of on patterns of accounts that are similar in terms of responding or commenting on misinformation, but we haven't yet developed um, sort of a, a plan to actually look at whether these were bots, just primarily because of the complexity involved at the moment, just to delve into the information. All right, now I realize we're very close to two o'clock, so I've possibly got time for just one more question. Um, and that is, uh, hmm, who should I send this one to? Uh, perhaps to Joyce or Prasanth um, to ask you if the, the most virulent, I can't believe I actually said that correctly, misinformation, <laughs> that's such a hard word, uh, tends to use images as well as text, or is it just text? So what really catches people's attention? Do you get a sense of that? No, I think uh, the images, um, oh, sorry, the text that come with images, naturally catch people's attention and um, they'll probably watch a little bit of it or three, four, five minutes into a video or something. Um, if uh, if people are posting stuff that's text-based only, the, the, you know, there's sort of less uptake on uh, con people, I guess, engaging with it. Um, but where you have, I mean, generally, this is generally speaking and not just sort of one COVID and uh, misinformation on. Yeah, um, but right, I've not seen a lot of that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you go on. You go on. Yeah, no, I've not. I've not seen a lot of that on Facebook compared to what's circulating on WhatsApp. Right. Because we're getting a lot of video, audio, video materials, audio materials, um, images flowing through WhatsApp compared to Facebook, and so that might be another platform that needs sort of uh, attention from the yeah. administrators and harder to dive into. I did see one very last question I'm going to throw in from Arabella Colliwan, which just asks, and Gary, I might bounce this one back your way. Do you feel like enough health experts and professionals have been out, been public and talking about these issues? And if not, would you like to encourage more to do so? Yeah, um, uh, easy answer is no, not enough. There, there's got to be a lot more health professionals out there talking. Um, and like Belinda said, um, we have to reach out. We have to feed the beast. The media is a big beast, and it's it's hungry. Um, we've got to feed what what it needs. It's not if not, it's, it's just going to go around looking for me information um, and and then start putting out information that we don't want put out there. Um, so we've got to provide the factual information, the correct information, and a lot more health professionals have got to come out and start talking, uh, and then start helping the response. Uh, get get the wheels rolling. I I realize one of our young emergency physicians, um, and I thank you for the question. It's it's really true. Um, we all need to be 
doing our part and I encourage you, any physician, anybody uh, listening out there as a health professional, you got to start um, advocating for the right things to be done now. Gary, thank you very much. And thanks to you and the rest of our panel, Belinda, Joyce and Prashant. Thanks so much for being part of this conversation today. Thanks to you watching remotely. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much to be discussed in this area. We'll be sharing a link to today's discussion shortly on email and as soon as it's available, you'll get that message. Thanks to my production team who helped, this all, helped make this all happen today and to our event sponsors. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in today and look forward to our next event from the AusPNG Network at the Lowy Institute. Bye for now. <laughs>